Imperial Yeast is at it again with their Imperialis project, creating yet another unique proprietary strain through hybridization. In addition to its excellent attenuation and rapid reduction of diacetyl, I-10 Mangosteni contributes robust, ripe tropical fruit, strawberry, and lychee notes that complement modern hops. And as a Kvike hybrid, it can be fermented anywhere from 78 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 to 32 degrees Celsius without any negative issues. Head over to imperialyeast.com to learn more about I-10 Mangosteni and be sure to pick some up for your next batch of fruity IPA. Welcome to the Brew Lab. One of the more interesting challenges facing brewers today is monitoring and understanding how to brew with changing raw materials. As the world gets hotter, growers face new challenges like intense heat, water shortages, and even the threat of wildfires and wildfire smoke. What are growers and brewers to do in the face of the changing world climate? I'm your host, Kay Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with Dr. Campbell Morrissey, Director of Brewing Operations at Freem Family Brewers, and Dr. Harmony Bettenhausen, Director of the Hartwick College Center for Craft Food and beverage and we're going to talk about how climate change impacts the backbone ingredient of beer and that is barley first i've got to ask them whether climate change impacts barley and big shocker guess what it does Um, but then we'll get into the meat of the discussion we'll talk about some of the specific ways that climate change impacts barley and how brewers can respond to those changes we'll talk about challenges with water and of course things like heat and disease resistance and disease pressure Um, we'll talk about options that breeders growers and maltsters are coming up with to address these issues and address issues that might arise in the future. Things like breeding for drought and heat tolerance, or in Campbell's case, taking heirloom varieties like Maris Otter and adapting them for the new world but still continuing to keep keep that classic Maris Otter flavor. So this episode's about discussing the challenges that face us with respect to barley, but it's also about how we as a community of beer enthusiasts can address those challenges. There should be equal parts optimism and realism, so I hope you have fun. We wrapped up 2023 and we're on to 2024, and as we look into the year that's passed and look forward to the new year... I'm thankful for all of our listeners and especially our patrons. We wouldn't be able to do this thing without you. And if you're not currently a patron, I encourage you to head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy and check out the monthly contribution levels. By becoming a patron, you not only are helping us keep this thing going, you also get access to brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never published, new discounts each month to yakimavalleyhops.com, and for $3, access to a monthly live Q&A session with a special guest from the brewing industry. We've had guests like John Palmer, Jamil Zanishev, Vinny Chalot, Lerzo and even Mr. Brulosopher himself, Marshall Schott. And when you sign up, all of those prior sessions become available to you on our private Patreon Facebook page. So please head over to patreon.com slash brulosophy to find all the information you need to get access to this awesome resource. Thank you to everyone that's left a rating or review of the show. If you haven't yet left a rating or review, I'd love for you to do so. Every review helps us improve the show. I read all of them and I love hearing from you. So if you haven't yet done it, please take a moment to help us out. Feedback this week is brought to you by the team at Haas, who are constantly innovating to provide solutions to your brewing problems. We've all had hazy IPAs, and since you're listening to this show, you know that getting a stable haze can be a challenge. Imagine you've brewed this awesome hazy IPA, you added your Whirlpool and dry hops, it's looking great while fermenting, and then drops crystal clear after you crash it. Well, the folks at Haas have you covered, introducing Hop Haze, their newest brewing product. Hop Haze can be used in post-fermentation to add a stable hazy complexion to beer and other beverages. It's 100% hop derived flavorless in beer and requires no additional mixing before use and the haze stability is the same as the shelf life of your beer so if you want to achieve that juicy look in your next hazy ipa be sure to try hop haze and also check out all of haas's other innovation innovative products at john that's john the letter i h a a s dot com all right, listener Pennywise84 left a review from Australia saying, fantastic for beer geeks. <laughs> That's it. So uh, thank you, Pennywise. Um, apart from your creepy <laughs> username, I love the comment. Like I said, I do receive, uh, I do review, review and read every comment. I certainly love the positive ones like this one, fantastic for beer geeks. And I hope um, that all of the other beer geeks like myself uh, do enjoy the show. Thank you, Pennywise84, for the positive review. All right, I'm going to take a quick break, and I'll be back in a few minutes with Campbell and Harmony talking about barley and climate change. (laughs) 
One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out deltabrewingsystems.com. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. The world is getting warmer, which means climates are changing and areas where barley and hops are grown are getting warmer and having more trouble getting sufficient water to irrigate crops. It's a difficult issue for the industry, but we have some incredibly brilliant researchers working in this area trying to help us out. And two of those brilliant researchers are here with me in the lab today, Dr. Harmony Bettenhausen and Dr. Campbell Morrissey. Harmony, welcome back to the Brew Lab. Hi, Kate. Thanks a lot for having me back. Oh, of course. I'm always happy to have you. And Campbell, welcome back as well. Thanks. Excited to uh, talk about how everything is getting worse. (laughs) Worse and better. How everything is getting worse and better. And also, a big congratulations to you, Campbell, for recently completing your PhD while holding down a full-time position as the Director of Brewing Operations at Frame Family Brewers. That's not easy. So congrats, man. Thanks. No, I appreciate it. Yeah. And of course, part of this is uh, part of Campbell's work uh, for his PhD was uh, on uh, certain uh, barleys that may or may not be uh, more susceptible, more um, uh, useful as we uh, experience climate change. So we'll get into that as well. And um, Harmony, I feel like we were just talking a few weeks ago about how climate is impacting barley on that malt COA episode, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we were we, uh, all. The, uh, it's it's impacting malt quality. Um, it's impacting uh, what goes on the COA. It's imp- impacting yields, uh, pre-harvest sprout. And Campbell is a brewer from your work. Um, you know, as a brewer and from your work uh, with uh, Pat Hayes at OSU. Are you seeing changes in barley too? Uh, yeah, I mean, from a brewing perspective, first and foremost, is barley is more expensive, or malted barley is more expensive than it's ever been. Um, you know, I grew up in the era that everyone used to say malt is cheap. Um, so efficient, like poor efficiencies in brew houses uh, could really just be mitigated by adding another bag of malt or, you know, a couple, a couple hundred pounds and it didn't really move the needle on your cost of goods. Uh, but with a more competitive landscape, you know, more expensive raw materials, I think brewers are all trying to better understand what that supply chain is going to look like, you know, in the next 10 years and even the next year. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it, there's lots of challenges. I mean, that's not even talking about the other things, you know, the, some of the more granular issues of like higher protein level that we're starting to see, you know, that are actually impacting brew house processes. I mean, we're talking about just like yield, right? Uh, farmers are having to increase costs because yields are down and they're because their water is more expensive and maybe they're having to uh, deal with heat stress, you know, in their barley. All of these things are climate change related. And so we're going to spend some time talking about the challenges of climate change and how uh, barley and uh, maltsters and barley growers are responding to those changes. But a quick reminder. So Harmony, you are director of the Hartwick College Center for Craft Food and Beverage with a PhD uh, from Colorado State University. And Campbell is the director of brewing operations at Freem Family Brewers with his recent PhD from Oregon State University. So y'all were both recently part of a panel Panel at the MBAA national meeting in Seattle talking about climate change and its impact on barley. And so I wanted to ask what prompted uh, that talk? Why did you guys feel like we needed to have a panel discussion um, at the MBAA national meeting? You know, I think what I was just talking about is brewers are really keenly aware of not only the, the rising cost of raw materials, availability, uh, but also the change in quality and kind of better understanding what that's going to mean for 
producing beer um, on at scale and meeting the quality metrics. I mean, we see it a lot over the last two years. We've had issues related to barley that I think were kind of more one-off from a craft brewing perspective. Um, you know, we're seeing the high proteins that we see off the fields, uh, the increased enzyme activity in American bar malt, and then obviously high fan being really problematic from a stability standpoint. And especially as beer, I think gets more competitive. Um, you know, it was just yesterday we saw another brewery legacy brewery in Oregon had sold, uh, is closing their production operations due to just costs and competitive nature of the market. So getting better understanding on how to make beer efficiently for a cost that's not cost prohibitive to consumer, but is also flavor stable is really of interest to a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah, that's a great brewer's perspective too. You know, I mean, cost of goods sold is important, and yeah, Ecliptic, right? I think that's the one you were talking about that just got yeah. sold. Um, yeah, it adds to the list of breweries in the Pacific Northwest that are that are that are getting sold. Um, and then Harmony, also, you know, from like a mal- from a grower, maltster, and also you know somebody that's looking and intensely at malt quality. Um, climate change is also impacting malt quality too, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. And and just going back to that panel for a minute, and the reason we we chose to have that. Um, you know, we also wanted an opportunity to introduce people at MBAA to the, con- the you know, the kind of workflow, uh, the breeder to end user perspective and how it all works together and the opportunity to look a little more closely at um, craft malt. Uh, and the opportunity there, of course, is, you know, as we talk about climate change, it's going to be, you know, those transportation costs are already out of control for raw materials. Um, so, you know, supporting a more local regional supply chain will become much more important as we move into the future. Uh, that's another good point too, right? I mean, supply chain costs are going up, increases, you know, gas and fuel, um, transportation, uh, all of that stuff is increasing as well too. And and with an already struggling, you know, uh, a crop, that, that can certainly impact things. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, all of these challenges. We're going into a, little, a lot more detail on them. Uh, but then also hopefully um, we're going to end on some things that are, are reasons for hope, hope for the future. Um, you know, hopefully we're not going to see the end of, of beer or barley anytime soon, um, especially with brilliant minds like Harmony and Campbell working on this issue. Okay, so then um, the, the the top of the show, we got to start with, um, I, I think the answer to this is yes, um, uh, but we're going to, we'll, we'll go into it in detail. Does climate change impact barley? Yeah, yes. a- absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Harmony. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I mean, the climate change itself, as we just talked about, can lead to, um, you know, changes in the composition, uh, the physical composition of barley that may lead to issues in the brew house, you know, in the malt house and in the brew house. Um, it leads to supply deficits in uh, malting barley due to those effects of temperature and water stresses. Um, land use changes and population growth. Um, you know, let's face it, there's um, not a whole lot of farming land uh, left in a lot of areas. Um, barley production is, as we know, highly sensitive to water availability, um, changes in those precipitation patterns that we are seeing quite often, uh, increased frequency of droughts, uh, you know, in, uh, in the western half of the country, and then just crazy weird weather out this way. Um, it's not enough to ensure a stable supply. Um, and of course, we know that those increased temperatures alter the growth of um, the growth cycle of barley, um, reducing what's called the grain filling period and affecting malt quality. Um, I think just very briefly, it's important to remember for our, our, our science people, out, well, for everybody, you know, the type of um, photosynthesizer that barley is, it's called a C3 plant. Um, and that's important because they take carbon dioxide directly from the air and use um, the enzyme, which may, may or may not be familiar with, called Rubisco, to fix it into a three-carbon compound. Um, and it, all this to say that um, this is in contrast to C4 plants like uh, corn and sugarcane, which are much more um, adept to being able to survive in hot, sunny, drought-ridden sort of climates, whereas barley and wheat are very much are very much not. And steps have been taken to try to breed for that. But Campbell can speak more to the breeding side of that. But but absolutely, um, all of these changes that we're seeing um, in, in our environment that affect everything else are certainly affecting our crops and, bi- and barley, of course, primarily. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned a bunch of really interesting things there too, which is like you know the the the, the supply chain or supply deficits. Just you know, not not just in 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 terms of you know the actual yield of the crop, but you know the land that is available for growing barley. I mean, that's a huge thing, right? I mean, if we think about if if uh, you know these regions where barley is normally grown are getting hotter and drier, and barley, like you just mentioned, is a C three plant, it's susceptible, um, you know, to those uh, sorts of conditions. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly see we're going to we're going to eventually run out of places to grow barley or at least maybe not run out of places but severely limit uh you know where barley can be grown sustainably unless we make changes uh to barley and and uh, that's a lot of what your research was looking at Campbell right whenever you were doing your PhD at Oregon State Yeah absolutely and I think the one thing I want to kind of just follow up with Harmony's discussion on is I think a lot of people either don't know or forget that you know, barley thought of as this big commodity crop, but in the grand scheme of things, it's actually a pretty small crop in the U.S. And we really only grow it for malt quality. So barley is a fairly res- resilient crop. And if you were growing it for a feed perspective, you're looking at yield and things like that. And you're kind of less worried about other quality metrics. But since we grow almost exclusively malt barley, it's that double-edged sword of not only do we have challenging yields, but we're losing opportunities to you know, meat malt quality due to the climate change stress, which is going to reduce farmers' willingness to grow it, which is going to continue to drive pressure to not grow malting barley. So I think that's not only do we just have struggles there, but we will start seeing reductions in acreage. And without a really robust secondary market outside of malting in the U.S., that's going to continue to be a challenge. That's interesting. Where would you see like a secondary market coming up for barley? You know, in other countries, Canada is a great example. Uh, feed barley is still a big part of their supply chain. Actually, more barley is grown in Canada for feed than it is for malting. Oh, wow. Um, it's still a big feed uh, feed crop in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, Russia and Ukraine are big barley producing countries and not a lot of it's going to malt. So from a global standpoint, it's really still a feed crop for various livestock feeding operations. Here, though, we've really lost that due to the low cost of corn production. Um, and so almost year over year, corn is going to be cheaper than barley to feed. So there's very little interest in growing it. Some people will grow it as a rotational and try to sell it, you know, maybe at a break even or a little lost uh, as a nice cover crop because it plays a great role in rotations. But, you know, if you're growing barley, you're probably trying to grow it for malt. You need to grow it under contract. Um, that's the only really way to grow barley in the U.S. Um, and you're really focusing on a niche of places that barley has been adapted for malt quality production. So the big three in the U S are Southern Idaho where it's irrigated and then Montana and North Dakota where it's mostly dry land. So it's kind of a really small niche that we need to really focus on getting that. And I think harmony brings up a really good point. And the beauty of craft malt is craft malt's not going to change the world, but it's creating these small supply chains in places that either barley had been a big a big crop like Northeast and Midwest, um, or even in smaller places where like the Southeast, where, you know, as breeders have really focused on developing strain or barley varieties that are well adapted to kind of hotter, wetter places, you know, all of a sudden craft malt has really been able to take advantage of that and leverage some of the interest in growing barley from farmers now that there's a potential market for it. Yeah, totally, and that it brings up another interesting point too, right? Uh, the the barley came to uh, you know the United States, if I remember correctly, from talking with Pat Hayes. Barley came to the United States from uh, from Europe. It was it's not a it's not a uh, crop that was grown originally in the United States, which means it sort of came on the the eastern United States, and that's where it was planted originally, right? And then it sort of migrated and moved its way across the country as people migrated, and then sort of ended, or maybe ended or or found its home, let's say over in the the Pacific Northwest, Idaho, Montana, South Dakota, like you just mentioned, uh, uh, Campbell. But Harmony, are they growing barley in the Northeast uh, now? As my understanding from our last discussions, there is some barley uh, being starting to be grown in the Northeast. Yeah. um, Over the past 10 to 15 years, there have definitely been strides made to improve the quality um, of barley grown in the Northeast and established, you know, similarly to what the OSU, the Barley World team is doing um, in the Pacific Northwest, um, breeding varieties specifically adapted to those areas. Um, our breeder, uh, Mark, Dr. Mark Sorrells at Cornell and um, uh, Nicholas San Antonio um, 
from Virginia Tech are doing a great job of breeding for this area, um, varieties that are um, resistant to certain abiotic and biotic stresses that are out here, and of course, adapted to the weather, which includes um, imparting some dormancy into those barley varieties. Um, and I also wanted to say that another, uh, actually out here, one of the uh, secondary markets that people are getting into is pet food. Oh, so. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh, b- yeah. Barley for pet food. That certainly sounds like it's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I guess that's another form of feed, I guess. Right. But yeah, pet pet food and, and uh, the uh, certainly a secondary resource or secondary market for barley seems like it would be a good thing. I mean, we talk about this sometimes in hops, too, right? How hops and barley seem to be they're They're just used in beer, right? So as beer goes, so goes barley and hops, uh, these these agricultural quantities, right? If beer is is seeing a golden age like it's seen over the past decade or so, and if it's slowing um, in growth like it is now, then we start to see um, slowing in, in uh, areas like uh, where agricultural areas in the agricultural ingredients that support those. And that's a big deal as climate change happens, right? Because as climate change happens, that means there's already pressures on the growers, and then the growers also aren't able to charge as high a price as they might have been in years past um, because brewers could pay more and consumers were paying more for beer and all of that sort of stuff. So all of this stuff kind of like it just starts to compound, right? <laughs> and and feel a little bit daunting uh, in some way. But there is hope. Um, I wanted to ask then too, um, and I think both of you have experience with this, but I'll start with Harmony on this question. So there are, from a, from a quality perspective to the malt, or to the to barley, I guess I should say, from a quality perspective, what is happening to barley? What are some of the challenges that happens to barley because of these climate change issues? Um, well, we face, uh, well, like, you know, just going back to our previous podcast together, uh, talking about all of those metrics on the COA, all of those will start to change. And we need to kind of um, adapt our thinking um, when we think about how those are changing. You know, we'll, che- we'll, we'll see changes, obviously, in protein um, in those areas where people experience drought. Of course, there'll be potentially higher protein, which can affect a lot of those factors on the COA. Um, Enzyme activity, of course, um, extract, obviously, because that has an inverse relationship with the protein. Um, We'll see a lot of different issues happening, even within the the malt house and the ability to create great quality malt out of, um, you know, either that high protein or water sensitive barley. Um, which means it doesn't want to take up water and you have to adjust your steep in the malt house and it takes a lot of finagling. Um, any sort of pre-harvest sprouting, which is when um, I think we've talked about before, when the barley starts to um, sprout in the field due to some rain at harvest events, all of those lower the malt quality and um, we'll have to just adjust our expectations when we are looking at that COA. And again, just reiterating, that's why it's important to look at um, all of those metrics. And truly understanding that um, I wanted to bring up something that we brought up at um, at MBAA. And I think a lot of those brewers, uh, a lot of brewers in general, look at the um, the parameters that the American Malting Barley Association puts out. And it's important to remember that those are standards for breeders and not standards for brewers. And um, it's just going to become increasingly important that we are flexible and don't, uh, as we spoke about before, um, just target in, focus in on one metric on the COA um, and consider anything below or above that less than good. Yeah. for use in the brew house. Yeah, like I think one of the things we talked about was fan, right? And and, and uh, Campbell's already mentioned that fan uh, may be increasing and, and having too much fan could be sort of detrimental. I've got an upcoming uh, episode, or I'm uh, sorry, uh, it's a past episode uh, with uh, Dr. Glenn Fox uh, where we talked about fan um, and, and talking about how, you know, having too much fan can be problematic in the brew house. Now, I asked that question before, we, before I, I, I forget, uh, Campbell. I was asking about changes uh, to barley quality and malt quality. What's the brewer's perspective uh, on this climate change and changes to malt quality? Yeah, so from the on on the ground perspective, you know, first and foremost, the thing we're going to see is reduction in extract. Um, so not only is barley more expensive, but on a pure pound basis, you're getting less starch to work with. So you're already having to increase costs associated with that. You know, we're moving more barley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it, it's I think your average you know, craft brewer is not really going to notice that on a huge, you know, sure. They might 
be talking about 25, 50 pounds of brew, which is not insignificant. But if you think about that, like on a global perspective, um, you know, we're talking about millions of extra pounds of malt that's going to be required to achieve the same extract, for example. And, you know, then you, it's this kind of like vicious cycle because, you know, then we're moving a million more pounds and then we're malting a million more pounds and, you know, the disposing of a million more pounds. So all of a sudden that does actually have this like annoying climate impact on its own. <laughs> totally. uh, so, so yeah, that's challenging. Then you have increased protein, uh, both total protein and most likely some increase in soluble protein. And so that's going to, that's going to give you problems in uh, haze formation in the brew house, true ex- excess troop formation, which is increasing loss. So things that you're going to have to manage throughout um, to in- ensure, you know, stable beer quality as well as efficiencies and losses ac- accordingly. Then what we're going to start seeing is like flavor degradation, in my opinion. Um, you know, fan is kind of the big one. Uh, I'm a fangelist, if you will. <laughs> uh, and so fans are pretty misunderstood metric. I think, um, you know, for years, breeders were actually kind of moving to ensure we had enough fan, um, kind of increasing fan levels uh, from what, you know, some European malts would probably have traditionally. And that was really to support large scale adjunct brewing, um, you know, unmalted adjuncts are not going to carry their own free amino nitrogen. So that's going to be a major source of yeast nutrients. Uh, but all malt brewing does not need the levels of fan that we typically see in North American malt, um, you know, in that kind of like 180 to 250 range, you know, and we're probably, probably sufficient. I, I believe sufficient below 150, um, but 150 would be a nice, a nice number if we got that every time. And so what that's really going to do is it's really going to influence the the flavor stability um, and flavor degradation of all malt beer. You know, Kate, I'm sure you've done it. You know, you've done these kind of off flavor trainings and you do, you know, oxidized beer and it's always trans to non and all uh, the classic aldehyde that goes really papery. That's really a factor of lager beer aging. Um, and when you talk about all malt, you're really working on like Strucker aldehydes and compounds that are going to give you more like sweet toffee uh sherry notes kind of going into like meaty um and all these things are various pathways from specific amino acids that are left in beer due to unassimilated fan so this is just fan that's in excess of what's needed and that is going to continue to be a problem um especially as the consumer is getting savvier and as you've seen the consumer is looking for flavors that are not like that (laughs) they want bright huge fruit um you know look at some of the best-selling beers right now and they're all they're they're not associated with like delicate aging (laughs) Um, (laughs) right and the last one that i think didn't get enough attention is due to changes in uh germination and changes in kilning required due to all of the you know incoming grain quality issues is we're seeing a lot more dms precursor coming through in malt um you know and so as a lager focused all malt brewer um, fighting DMS has now become one of our biggest uh, malt quality issues. And obviously there's br- brewing levers we can pull to do that. Uh, but I think that's something that has never really been a focus of breeding per se, has always been kind of been able to take, been taken, taken care of in the malt house or in the brew house. Uh, but we're really having to change our processes to accommodate. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, right? So, having to change processes to accommodate not, not, not just proteins, but, but DMS too. And I guess, you know, back on proteins for just a second, um, Harmony, we were talking about on uh, the last episode uh, where we were talking about, um, you know, the, the malt COA, that FAN is, is a measure of, you know, free amino nitrogen, but it doesn't tell you which amino nitrogens, right? It's just the, 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 the free amino nitrogens that are, are uh, 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 available in that, that metric. And as I as I learned from Glenn Fox, one really big one is proline, and it's not even measured um, in the ASBC assay uh, for free amino nitrogen. So, and that's actually, you know, um, Harmony. I don't know if you want to talk about Dr. Fox's research, but you're welcome to. Um, he's done a lot of research looking at you know storage proteins and how the composition of protein might actually matter. Yeah, I mean, you actually kind of just summed it up, but absolutely, yeah, the free amino nitrogen assay does not measure proline. And um, if we remember anything about how yeast takes up amino acids, um, it does not prefer proline. Um, We have, there have been some recent discoveries of some yeast that do consume proline, but we aren't sure how much it is not completely consuming proline. 
Um, and also, so proline actually does comprise um, most of the amino acid composition. Uh, so it's uh, it's interesting that we don't individually measure that similarly to we do like, you know, for DP and alpha amylase, like measure those individual things. Uh, but it is, it is important that it does lead to um, uh, off flavors um, eventually in, in beer. So it's kind of important and it's, it's something that Campbell and I actually do talk a lot about and have done a little bit of research on. Um, but yeah, as far as Dr. Fox's research, yeah, he's done a lot of work on those storage proteins. And, you know, speaking of, of that related to climate change, you know, those storage proteins will begin to, and it's not something that we measure, we just measure total protein. And we've begun to sort of rethink um, the ways in which we might um, introduce a metric like that, you know, maybe on the COA or maybe for special requests or something in the future, but um, we don't actually measure the amounts uh, of storage proteins or the composition of storage proteins on a regular basis. And that becomes really, um, really interesting uh, because those types of storage proteins are really going to influence um, everything through, you know, the malting process and, and the brewing process. Um, another thing we don't talk enough about is um, steely and, and mealy sorts of kernels as well, you know, and water uptake, things like that. And those will also start to change as we um, experience more variable climate situations. Yeah, that's right. Like, I, I think friability was one of the things that we mentioned on the malt COA, right? That's going to be more variable um, when, uh, when uh, you know, uh, with climate change, which is going to result in milling issues, right? Or, or having to change uh, processes in the brew house. Now, you know, it, it is sort of interesting, too, that, that um, I, you know, all of these changes in, uh, in malt, uh, you know, it seems like there may be something that we can do in the brew house to sort of mitigate or change. Uh, but hearkening back to that episode harmony where we talked about the malt COA sounds like it's going to become increasingly important, important for brewers to know what's on their malt COA and not only just what's on the malt in front of me, but how has it changed and how has it, uh, how's it going to impact my recipe and my brewing process and all that going forward? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say if a brewer weren't monitoring their COA, and again, we say this all the time, but I would be, I would start now and start collecting data um, and understanding, you know, what your baseline is now when you have um, semi, you know, quote unquote, normal malt for your, re or you have a recipe um, that's working well for you. I would monitor that right now and understand more about what's going on than just waiting, you know, kind of putting your head in the sand and, and waiting for the future to come. And then all of a sudden you have this malt and you're like, well, it isn't working for me anymore. What went wrong? You know, maybe the protein is, you know, the same number, but that's just a total protein number, right? Um, that doesn't reflect everything that's going on inside. So I think it's, it's really important as these things happen. And again, just back to um, understanding what's going on throughout the supply chain, you know, talking to your maltster if you can, you know, if you're supporting uh, local or regional craft maltster, um, understanding what's going on in the malt house. How was this malted? Were there challenges? Was this water sensitive? What, you know, where did this come from? Um, did, you know, were there any challenges? Did this come from a drought situation? Understanding all of that will help you understand in the brew house what you might be dealing with. Yeah, and, and Campbell, I mean, I'm sure a brewery like Freem is, uh, you know, looking at every malt COA that comes in for the lots of uh, barley that you guys are using. Yeah, we, uh, we're we pretty lucky that we bring in a couple different silo malts, and so we're getting COAs on every one of those. Um, and then we start tracking it on some of our other, you know, we use a lot of bulk bag, so we track it there. And it, it's, it's awesome as a data person, you get a bunch of free data, you don't have to do any you know, actual assays on it. And they just give it to you. <laughs> yeah, um, right. And so, you know, what better way to like correlate things on your brewing process to, to your malting COA. And just, I mean, just like, again, you know, I, I've said extract, extract, extract for, for small brewers to me, that's, you know, you may as well just look at that, you know, and a couple of the other metrics to adjust your mill, but that's going to be your biggest driver on performance, you know, because you can just, if you know your extract coming in and you know your gravity coming out and your volume, you can be tracking your mash efficiencies really easily. And I'm always a, a surprised how few people do that um, and really take a really deep dive into understanding that. And then, you know, you're never going to line up perfectly with 
malt extract. And so then you can start looking at like, well, what else is driving it here for us? Um, you know, once you get out of these like really large automated brew houses, you know, brewing, the brewing process is so unique among the 10,000 craft brewers uh, here. And so there's not one COA that works for, or not one COA metric that's going to work for every brewer. And you do kind of have to do a little trial and error to see what's driving variation on your system. And so then you can really focus on tracking like, you know, three or four variables and just really focusing on those and really getting to understand them. Um, it turns out maltsters really like talking. And so if you just call them and say, Hey, would you explain to me why, you know, this is changing or what would that might mean? They would love to better interface, um, with brewers. Cause I mean, the adage used to be one malt was cheap, but it was always the maltsters fault. Um, and so they really want to talk to <laughs> yeah. brewers and yeah. get brewers to better understand, you know, there's a little less romance, uh, of going to a malt house versus going to uh, like a hop yard. And so, but I do encourage, again, another great thing about craft malt, you know, just like we said, you know, every American now lives within like 10 miles or 30 miles of a craft brewery, but not many brewers live very close to a malt house. And so, you know, just walk down the street and go talk to your local craft maltster, even if you don't buy a lot of stuff from them, you know, it's, they're really o open books of talking about their process and how that's changing and, what they're doing and what it's going to mean for you. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I I think walking through a malt house is a lot of fun. I mean, it's just it's such a such a process, right? There's so much malt and uh, you know water and and uh, all of the different you know ways that they move everything around and the germination room. Just like there's nothing. It's it's like those two smells, right? The the germination room in uh in a malt house and the uh the brewery whenever during a mash and boil, right? Those two smells. I know them anywhere. I would always recognize them. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's super fun, and uh, you know, I would um, I would also encourage that because uh, especially in craft malt, everybody has you know similar to how craft brewing used to be. Um, uh, every craft monster seems to have a different process, so it's a, kind of important to understand um, what their process is and what they're doing with your grain. Well, doesn't matter what grain you're buying from them. It's really interesting to find out how they're dealing with their own challenges with their own equipment because not everybody has the same equipment. Yeah, totally. Right, and changes for changes throughout all of the all, all of the breweries in the nation. I like what you said there, Campbell. You know, there's ten thousand different breweries and ten thousand different ways to brew beer, <laughs> um, right? Uh, and I think each person is each brewer is going to have uh, a different aspect of this that's going to be um, important to them and that's going to work for them and their system. But we're seeing, you know, like you guys have mentioned, we're seeing global changes. We're seeing changes in protein content. We're seeing changes in malt quality. We're seeing protein or uh, changes. Changes in extract potential. Uh, we're seeing difficulties for farmers, increased cost. Uh, you know, difficulties with supply chain. I mean, uh, uh, climate change isn't just impacting. You know, what's going on in the field to a grower. It's not just a grower issue. It's impacting everyone uh, for, in, through the whole system. And I mean, if brewers are, are having to pay more for malt, then they're probably going to be charging more for their beer and consumers are paying more for beer. And it just kind of, you know, goes in a cycle like that. Um, hopefully they can pass on some of those costs to consumers. But the world isn't coming to an end yet. Beer's been around for 3,000 years and we want it to be around for another 3,000. And so after this break, we're going to talk about um, some things and some, some reasons for hope. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. Is a world without barley a world without beer? Well, as Pat Hayes so eloquently mentioned on episode 36 of the show, no barley, no beer, and vice versa, no beer, no barley. Uh, since it doesn't seem like beer's going anywhere anytime soon, we've been discussing what happens to barley as a result of climate change. But first, I have to ask, um, and maybe I'll start with you, Harmony, on this one. If there was a barley apocalypse, what would you be drinking? Rye. 
Why? I was going to say, I was like, I laid, that was a softball. <laughs> I laid it up for you, right? We, we've done a show on uh, on rye. Um, so yeah, rye is what you'd be drinking, Harmony? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 100%. How about you? How about you, Campbell? I'm screwed. Uh, you know, <laughs> beer's my favorite beverage and then malt whiskey is probably my next. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, the the good news is we're we're a long way uh, from a barley apocalypse, right? Uh, you know, climate change is impacting things, and it certainly could lead there if we don't do things to 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 deal with climate change. But there are uh, reasons to hope for the future, and so one of the things, and I'm going to start with you with this one, Campbell. One of the big, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I guess I'm going to call it legacies of your P, uh, your advisor, Pat Hayes, is winter barley, right? Um, and and uh, the increase in the amount of winter barley that's grown in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just quick little history on winter barley. You know, from a, a domestic standpoint, winter barley has not really been considered malting quality. Um, really, it's only in the last two decades that we've even seen more winter barley being grown for malt quality and it's still only about 10 percent right now uh you know one of the big challenges is uh winter hardiness so survival um varieties that will survive um but also they tend to just have different grain quality metrics or had different grain quality metrics in the u.s uh that's that's not the case in europe um especially in the uk uh where mild winters have allowed for winter barley to be a big part of their malting barley. Um, Maris Otter is winter barley. So they've been, they've been growing malt quality winter barley, you know, since the forties and fifties, if not earlier. Uh, but one of the real advantages, you know, we talk a lot about summer heat, summer drought, you know, winter barley is planted in the fall over winters. And then you harvest it just a bit earlier than spring barley is, which is planted in the spring and harvested in the summer. And so you're taking advantage in most places where of of water when it's available. So that's either snow melt, um, spring rain, uh, those types of things. You know, additionally, it just has a lot better uh, weed uh, weed resistance because you're getting it in the field over the winter before weeds can start taking over. So it's established. Um, you know, it's a little less susceptible to some pests uh, for the same reasons. Um, and so we're really seeing it being quite ad- advantageous in some places where um, water is becoming really challenging. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the Klamath Basin, not a major malt barley growing region by any means, but uh, a really nice microcosm of all of the problems we're seeing. Um, you know, torturous water rights issues, huge legacy droughts. Um, so getting to see winter barley going in there and requiring in some cases less than half of the water as spring barley to make malt quality is really uh, drive some optimism in me. Um, and, you know, I keep saying to make malt quality and that's the important thing there is that, you know, even if your yields are good and you still need sufficient irrigation to, uh, promote grain fill. And that's where you're really going to drive up your extract and balance out your proteins. So even if you're, you're meeting your yield expectations, but if you're at 15%, that may as well just be a complete loss or 15% protein, excuse me, that may as well be a complete loss of a crop. Um, because you're not going to sell it for malt quality and you probably won't get enough for feed to make it worth it. So having access to water or, you know, either via irrigation or, you know, through just natural water sources is super important. Yeah. And I, and that's where winter barley and, and also, I guess, facultative barley, uh, which grows in, in winter or spring conditions. But both of those varieties of barley, like you said, you, you can kind of uh, to have access to water when water is available um, in places. It's not during the summer where it's hot and dry and you're having to bring in uh, water and, and irrigate more heavily, uh, you know, to, to make sure that the plant has the water that it needs. In the winter, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, winters here are wet and rainy. <laughs> You know, uh, there's a lot of water. And I wanted to, to take a minute to talk about that Klamath Basin because I, I've, I've heard you talk about this before and I understand it really is a nice microcosm of the issues that climate change has caused for bar- for barley, but also um, hope for the future. So you did some, some work where you've actually um, done a, a lot of your research on new barley varieties, um, including a new one, Lantra. We can talk about that um, if you want to as well, um, that, that are grown in the Klamath Basin, which is, I, I, I understand, like a notoriously drought, you know, kind of difficult area for growing barley these days? 
Um, so it's actually, it's a great place to grow barley. Oh, okay. Um, and <laughs> yeah. one of the reasons that they haven't grown barley is just kind of has markets have changed and uh, sourcing barley has changed. You know, one of the big challenges to getting barley in new places is usually rail lines. Um, so, you know, first you got to grow the barley. So you need a maltster to contract barley in that region. But then what do you do when the barley is ready to go? Um, it's really not cost effective to truck it. So most, you know, big places where they grow wheat or other things, they have a whole infrastructure associated with moving wheat off the field into the processors. That's usually by rail or, you know, here where I am in the Columbia Basin uh, on barge, um, really cheap and easy ways to move things. So if you don't have a rail line, um, it's going to be tough to just get barley somewhere. And so all the infrastructure for large scale barley production for malt is uh, centered in those those big states of Idaho, Montana, North Dakota. Um, and they've built the infrastructure around that. So it's kind of, uh, that, that aside is just why there isn't as much barley in, uh, in the Klamath Basin as there used to be. Um, you know, Coors used to have a, or Great Western had a big operation down in there with truck that would train barley up to Vancouver and they still do a little bit. Um, but with craft maltsters, they're able to kind of negotiate smaller deals, um, work directly with farmers and kind of make their own infrastructure supply chain. And so we've been working with, uh, craft maltster based out of the Bay Area, Admiral Malts, um, which, uh, you know, shameless plug, those guys are awesome. Um, <laughs> some of the most kind of progressive craft maltsters out there who really take an analytical scientific approach to the process and do floor malt. So they have this, you know, real boutique thing, but are real, they're science nerds at heart. Uh, and the issues in the Klamath Basin are that there's very little water. There's less and less of it. Um, it's harder to access. And most of their cash crops are pretty water intensive. Um, and so the two bigger crops down there right now are potatoes and alfalfa. Um, if you don't know, both of those are very water intensive and they are pretty much harvested throughout the summer. So adding barley into some rotations uh, offers a lot of benefit. Um, and, you know, especially winter barley, you know, can provide some of those ecosystem services because not only is it a good crop, but you got winter coverage um, in places where you know, you might have winter wind that starts eroding some topsoil if you don't have snow cover. Um, but also general, it also helps retain moisture in the soil um, by having a crop over winter. So if you can also get money for that crop, that's pretty advantageous. And malt barley, when it makes it, is actually a pretty profitable thing. So the more we can figure out how to get those crops established as part of a rotation, you know, no person who's selling potatoes to Frito-Lay is going to like you know, cut that contract and start making malting barley exclusively. <laughs> but if they can add it in every couple of years as a rotation, I think we have a lot of potential um, to work with different growers down there. Uh, interesting. Yeah. And and so that, it, it is really cool to think like, okay, using winter barley as rotational crops or as, you know, in places where you can, uh, where there are issues getting water. Uh, this is a really, really cool uh, thing to look at in the future. And actually, you know, another uh, plug for Admiral Malting. I mean, you you and Harmony uh, are uh, have both done research looking at the impact of floor malting versus pneumatic malting, which is uh, uh, something I hope to get you both back uh, to talk about on the show uh, in, in the future. And uh, uh, Harmony, I wanted to talk about like this barley supply chain issue because you mentioned earlier, you know, that um, growing barley in new locations, uh, you know, m is is a way, especially in like local regions, right? Um, and and uh, looking at craft maltsters who are, who are local to your region is a way to sort of relieve some of this pressure um, in the barley supply chain. Yeah, absolutely. And to follow up on what Campbell was saying, um, I, I just wanted to say that out here we are actually trialing some of um, Oregon State's varieties, facultative and winter varieties and Virginia Tech's winter varieties. Um, and it's important to impart that sort of resilience into our system because, as Campbell mentioned earlier, it's a hard sell for farmers to grow barley. It's not always profitable. And in my opinion, we don't always set them up for success with successful crops that grow well in our area. We sometimes try to pluck something from a different area and say, hey, grow here. And then we have a weird um, rain event or something like that. And they have total crop failure either due to, you know, you know, a drought situation or um, a pre-harvest sprouting situation. Um, and having those regionally adapted varieties will help ensure that we have more people growing it 
and a more local regional supply that's closer to brewers or distillers or whoever wishes to use it. I mean, you know, Campbell's right about the, you know, the, the rail yard or the, the trains and, you know, trucking, as we mentioned, has gotten so expensive. It's hard to find ways to transport barley um, or any grains across the country anymore. Um, so it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to transport them apart, uh, around, but if we can start growing, if we can start breeding regionally adapted barleys and growing them in local regions, that does relieve some of that pressure uh, that, that Campbell was mentioning earlier, you know, the global scale pressure of of having to add a little bit more malt because extract is down and, and those sorts of things. And um, Harmony, you mentioned something uh, just now and also earlier in the show, um, and it's this concept of dormancy and dormancy as it's related to like pre-harvest sprout. Let's talk about that for a little bit here, too. Uh, because that's certainly an impact of barley, um, um, of climate change on barley, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the winter barleys um, have been more recently bred to have, you know, to have some dormancy imparted in them. And what that means is, um, so you, you sort of, Pat explains this better, but you have this scale of either dormant or, you know, susceptible to pre-harvest sprouting. And so I guess what that all means, let's start with pre-harvest sprouting, though. Pre-harvest sprouting occurs, like I said earlier, when there's a rain event at or near harvest and things are wet and humid um, and the grain does what it does best and tries to grow a plant in the field. And that's not what we want. We want it to uh, be ready to harvest in dry conditions and we want to harvest it and have it germinate under controlled uh, circumstances in the malt house. Um, and when it, pre it does that, pre when it has pre-harvest uh, sprouting damage, um, it uh, decreases the amount of enzymes. It just really just, it's growing a plant. It's using its resources, right? So we don't have much of a situation where we can have a homogenous um, situation. Um, there will be some uh, kernels that are pre-harvest sprouted and some that aren't. And so when you get that into the malt house, you don't know which are which, right? Unless they're physically you know, sprouted, but you can't always see it. It's mostly happening on the inside. Um, but that's important because um, those are essentially done. So you're not going to get anything out of those. So what the dormancy does is it helps us, it, it's sort of a guard against that pre-harvest sprouting. Um, it imparts a little bit of like, no, I'm in my bed and I'm sleeping with a waterproof rain jacket on right now and I'm going to ignore this and I have more protection against um, any rain events. Um, and in severe rain events, it doesn't matter, you know, it might fail as well, but um, that is put there to resist, you know, those rain events and, you know, a lot of uh, abiotic, biotic stresses that may occur during um, weird parts of the, you know, early spring or, or summer. Um, and as Campbell mentioned, you know, those winter varieties are really important. The springs have to go through almost a whole summer, right, which with lots of disease pressure, insect pressures and um, other sorts of disease pressures. Um, and of course, weather temperature pressures um, and those winters, since they're harvested so early, um, it avoids all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it avoids all that. And and you mentioned you had to like breed a little bit of dormancy into varieties so that they'll grow up there where you are in New York. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, we, again, we don't have anything currently adapted to meet the pressures. So we have been, yes, people have been having to breed back in a little bit of dormancy to withstand um, those, those current pr and changing, very changing pressures. And again, just a reminder that it takes um, around 10 years for a barley to be bred into existence and hit the commercial market. Um, so things, you know, people were thinking about, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit different, but moving forward, um, you know, we need to be much more looking at the, the, the larger, you know, at the whole game and seeing what types of variable pressures we're going to be dealing with as we breed things, you know, like dormancy in. But also, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, around us, one of the major issues with actually breeding dormancy in is that we don't have the infrastructure for storage. And that's an important thing to remember. It comes out of the, the field and people are, you know, if the maltster can't malt it right away because it is dormant and it might take three to four months to come out of that dormancy, uh, there's, you know, there's been a real pressure in our area about who's going to store it where and how, and how safe it is in those conditions. Yeah. So. 
Uh, that's a, that's great, right? It harkens back to what Campbell was talking about about infrastructure. Now, Campbell, I wanted to talk too about breeding, right? And and breeding, uh, you know, for for resilience. I mean, this is what a lot of what your research was looking at, um, and of course, it's been a, a, a primary focus of, of of your advisor Pat Hayes during his time. And y'all came up uh, or have recently introduced a new variety, right? Um, Lantra. That's uh, that's uh, um, uh, maybe somewhat like Maris otter, but doesn't have some of the issues or susceptibilities that Maris otter had uh one of the major susceptibilities uh maris otter has is that there's a very unclear legality about growing maris otter in the united states um and so currently the seed owner or the the person who owns the rights to the maris otter seed does not allow it to be exported as anything but malt um and you can't plant malt so just to clear that up for listeners, uh, so <laughs> just in case anyone don't has take tried, a bag of two row malt and throw it out in the field, and I uh, think you're going to start a winter barley crop. <laughs> uh, and so the the breeding of Lantra came out of this idea: could we breed a contemporary heirloom? You know, the idea that can we? And this is something we talked about uh, the first time I came on the show. And you know, Lantra is the end end result of that. And you know, Lantra offers really lots of interesting things. Yes, it is a a daughter of Maris Otter. Um, it has performed well in our in our flavor trials, although grand scheme of things, what we found is barley variety contributes a nuanced contribution uh, to beer flavor. Uh, but really what's exciting about it is that it seems to be uh, apt for growing. You know, it's a strong winter malting variety that uh, offers real interest to craft maltsters, both due to the flavor and its kind of and its pedigree. And I think that's that's the most important part is that we have more. Uh, people who are interested in planting winter barley and we have more varieties for them to work with um you know everything from the the kind of crowning jewel in the osu variety release recently has been thunder um which is a real real kind of wallop of a a malting barley it's you know kind of high enzyme high fan it's great for adjunct uh brewing um but it's really kind of driving the interest in winter barley and other places and now we have something that's a little you know a little more moderated a little better for all malt craft brewing so just having more winter barleys that maltsters can then contract for various end streams of theirs that then brewers can use really starts diversifying the overall uh, supply of winter barley, you know, nationally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this com- this whole conversation around winter barley just seems like it's huge, um, especially as we talk about climate change, right? I mean, there's a lot of potential there for winter barley to uh, relieve some of the pressures on the industry. And when you have new great great uh, barley like Lantra that, that that are similar to or have similar tasting profiles to Maris Otter, which everyone knows and loves, I mean, that's a malt, an heirloom malt uh, variety that, that people love, then you have some options uh, for dealing with climate change and still getting quality malt for brewers. Uh, and so, uh, Harmony, uh, uh, I wanted to ask this kind of like uh, maybe leads into this a little bit. Um, I wanted to talk about some, f- uh, you know, far out options uh, that you guys think are coming. So we've got, you know, we're dealing with, um, you know, local uh, craft maltsters now. We're, we're um, encouraging those. We're tar- sort of starting to build supply chains. We're breeding new varieties. Uh, you know, all of these things are like now solutions, solutions for fixing things right now. But uh, what what's the future? I mean, what are some things that what are some far out options that we might be able to do? Well, um, well, first, uh, hearkening back to um, the breeding initiative, I just want to kind of call out the work that um, American Malting Barley Association and the National Barley Improvement Committee are doing um, to lobby for dollars for all of this research. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to call that out. And, and in fact, you know, we've got a really uh, the MBIC, um, our newest uh, initiative proposed um, focuses on objectives that include uh, breeding better barley for the future and managing that barley quality. Um, again, you know, not expecting everything to be OK in the few, it, it, in the near or far future, but sort of looking at ways to mitigate it. Um, and they're doing great work. And, and I just wanted to say that none of this work would really happen without those dollars. So I'm um, just kind of calling that out there. Um, so I think there are some innovative options that are going to be happening in the malt house. And maltsters, um, as we talked about at MBA, have been dealing with climate change for um, a long time um, since they've started to malt. They've been dealing with these sort of climate variation issues and how to work with malt in the malt house. Um, but they are 
very adept at learning how to uh, work with the challenges presented by climate change. Yeah, and, you know, th- things like, you know, gene editing or, or you know, um, uh, ways to, you know, uh, maybe can can speed along some of the processes for, uh, you know, for barley breeding. I mean, I, you know, a few weeks back, I talked to with uh, Chris Willig, um, um, who's doing some research on hop breeding, right, and how gene editing can deal with hop breeding. And while, of course, you can't just totally replace, you know, the entire genome with gene editing, Editing, there are tweaks and, and things that you might be able to do, like improving dormancy. Maybe we can get some newer varieties out there a little quicker. Things like that, right, are, are, are some, some nice far out options that aren't here today, but maybe will be um, in the near future. Yeah, I want to talk on that because I think Pat would require me to. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. One of the, the major differences between hops and barley, um, you know, they're looked at as the two primary you know, agricultural raw materials for brewing. And uh, so I think a lot of people think of them as fairly similar. Uh, you know, barley is still a, a public sector crop, um, especially in the U.S. Uh, there are a couple private. There's one There's one private breeding company in the U.S. that's not also a brewer. Um, and then everything else is pretty much public. So you got your land-grant universities are the kind of the bulk of that. And then the USDA ARS. You have Miller Coors and AB who have breeding operations. And then you have Lima Grain. So unlike Europe, where barley is more of a private sector crop and there's a lot more money associated with it, you know, barley is a public sector crop here. But where, whereas tools like CRISPR um, have a lot of potential for advancing our knowledge of, of genes that control various traits of interest, um, commercializing that is really challenging. Um, you know, and so CRISPR is is associated with uh, intellectual property, and so any any gene edited thing has to pay a uh, commission towards CRISPR. I don't, commission is probably not the right word, but you generally understand what I'm saying on some sort of like per pound or per unit basis uh, back to the owners of the technology. And so, in a crop that doesn't really cost very much uh, for most people, you know, when you add a few cents a pound, like that, that all of a sudden becomes prohibitive. So, I still think we're quite a ways away from using. Uh, CRISPR in any meaningful way to like develop new varieties. But I think what we're finding is, you know, there's a lot of potential to help us as researchers, you know, learn, okay, what's controlling that gene, um, candidate gene validation, those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of the big takeaways from Chris's talk, right? Is that, is that we're not necessarily, you know, trying to create like, like one end goal sure can be to create new varieties, but the understanding, like the knowledge that you can generate by using a tool like CRISPR and figuring out which genes actually matter, give breeders that are doing traditional breeding practices, the ability to then, you know, make targeted breeding, right? You can start to look at genomes and find find um you know uh, your your crosses that have the specific things right and and that and that can grow there which i think is awesome and one other thing campbell uh, that i wanted to talk to you about specifically too is is that w- uh, you know we've we talked about like uh, you know changes that growers can see or breeding new hops or that sort of stuff but there are also things that can happen in the brewery right when the smalt comes to you it's not like ah oh, crap the smalt is you know lower extract i have to toss it all out or i can't make beer anymore <laughs> right i mean i mean the brewer's going to use the malt and and there are things like enzymes and, you know, changing processes that, that can help uh, as barley quality changes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, 10 years ago, we would have, wouldn't be having the same conversation. You know, brewers, especially craft brewers, looked at those kind of processing aids as kind of like the reason we do what we do and the reason AB and those big adjunct lager production does, you know, they use enzymes. We don't, we're natural process, whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's really changed. Um, and I, I honestly think it was like a hop vector, if you will, um, <laughs> because brewers started getting into hop products and things that they probably wouldn't have thought would be of interest, you know, 10 years ago because they were finding novel flavor production there. Um, similarly, you know, it's like if we care about flavor, sometimes you might have to use some, you know, beta-glucanases or proteases or or various things to achieve that <laughs> given the varying quality that we're going to have. Um, and that might be a factor of just your brewing technology. Um, you might have something that's, maybe you have a legacy brew house that's kind of like, you know, it's going to be tough to justify $10 million on a new brew house, but you can improve the quality of your beer through some enzyme usage. So I think brewers are more willing to play around with those things um, and seeing the benefit of them. And it's not some sort of like, the modification of their product. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the easiest ones I think to talk about is like you were talking about extract potential decreasing potentially, you know, as climate change and 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 heat stress and all that, um, you know, decreasing extract potential. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity to add in some, you know, AMG or some amylases to increase, uh, you know, that that extract potential if you're not already using, um, you know, enzymes or something like that in your brew house. But it sounds like there are options in the brew house for brewers as malt comes to them, even amidst these uh, climate pressures yeah and and i think ironically um given what we're seeing with malted barley and just seeing what we would all like to see with like flavor stability uh one of the best tools we found from uh mitigating higher protein higher fan barley and improving flavor stability is using less um you know using a little more like sugar adjunct or things like that and that that just happens to be tying you know what what's the new hot style right now west coast ipa you know, how do you dry out West Coast IPA? Dextrose. So by using a little <laughs> bit of dextrose in there, we're obviously, we're diluting that fan quite a bit, making a lighter body beer, um, lowering the pH, doing all these things that are going to promote flavor stability and kind of mitigate this high fan North American barley that's just going to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, on that note, um, I'm going to throw this question to Harmony. It's that time, Harmony. You know what question's coming, coming and hopefully you've had some time to prepare for it. If you uh, if you want brewers to take away one thing from today's episode, what would it be? Uh, I would say um, a few things, actually. Um, I would say be flexible. Um, understand what the COA is telling you and what it's not telling you. Um, you know, things that you've collected, your data that you've collected should be telling you a story. I would pay attention to it. Um, and, and like Campbell just said, it's important to understand what you can and can't do. I mean, it, you know, if we've got a high fan malt, use less. Uh, people, you know, things are changing as far, as, even in the malt houses, as far as um, aids are concerned as well, you know, and we sort of have to. It, it's hard to be um, natural anymore in our processes when things are changing so quickly. Um, I would just Again, you know, be, speaking back, it's being flexible, um, understanding what you can make with a certain malt um, instead of what you cannot make with a certain malt and then rejecting it because that, that flies all the way back down to the beginning of the supply chain. You know, if one rejection, you know, it, it's a ripple effect of, of rejection and that's terrible. Um, and again, that does not um, allow a stable supply chain for our farmers and, and malt houses. Um, I mean, know your resources. You know, as a brewer, um, under, again, just understand what you can and can't do um, and, and how to do it and ask ask the questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love those. I love all of those as, as takeaways from this episode. So, Campbell, same question to you. If you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? I have two things. Okay. <laughs> you, you both you both failed. <laughs> Neither of you answered that, but that's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, we're, we're very good at answering questions very vaguely so that we have to continue to answer more questions and uh -huh. that there's always another paper to write. <laughs> exactly. There's always another paper. That's totally right. All right. Go for it. More research is required. <laughs> uh, the, the biggest thing I, I think people should remember is, you know, this is really going to affect all, all tiers of the supply chain. So, you know, growers maltsters, brewers, and we're going to have to start framing uh, a new conversation because, you know, just because we can grow barley in places that's going to, there's going to be rain places where there wasn't, there's going to be heat places that there wasn't, and it's going to cause a lot of problems across. And a lot of those problems right now are really only solved by more resources, um, like, you know, energy or water, and that's not sustainable either. You know, so, so really working with folks and like, being aware of what technology is changing and trying to like be proactive on that, you know, does, is it important to you that a maltster is using less water um, to the overall so, you know, carbon and resource footprint of your beer and, you know, talking to them and asking, you know, what are the, what have they done? And, you know, starting those conversations. And the second thing is, you know, and on the conversation thing is that, you know, we've, we've talked about it a few times today, but like craft, craft maltsters are there now. They want to talk. Um, Turns out they don't make beer, but they usually like drinking it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the other people who really like drinking beer are barley breeders. And so, <laughs> and I can attest to that. Uh, <laughs> right. But, you know, there are field days and there are malt house open houses that I really encourage brewers um, or even home brewers um, to go participate in. 
you will learn something. You will build a relationship. You will open a conversation. We all do this because we love it and it's really fascinating and we want to learn. Um, and so it's a whole world for people to start learning. And I think they're only going to become better users of Malt because they understand how to, how, what it takes to even get that product into their door so that they can make beer. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point about craft maltsters too, right? There's so many more craft malting companies than there were even 10 years ago. Um, so there's more options that are out there now to look at and more conversations that you can have, you know, um, especially if you're a you know regional craft brewer or a local craft brewer, you can, you've got options uh, out there. So not all is lost. Well, this is a great episode. Again, I'm so glad that you guys uh, joined me here and, and uh, also for doing the, the panel discussion that you guys did at the NBAA national meeting on climate change, because we have started having these discussions we got to have have these discussions now and we got to talk about what the where the future is going and then who knows maybe somebody will listen to this episode and come up with a great idea and um and and figure out some ways to uh solve some of these issues so thank you both uh for coming on the show and talking about climate change harmony thanks for coming and, and campbell you as well i should make a shameless plug for the uh 2024 craft malt conference um which is in davis california february 22nd to 24th uh, it's very affordable from as far as conferences goes. Uh, and I can attest that the quality of presentations will be very high. So if anyone is interested in malt, uh, we would love more brewers to get involved uh, in something like that, because I think that's a, that's a, a shocking uh, void in our uh, attendance at those events. Are, are uh, Campbell, are you and Harmony giving a presentation at that conference? Yes. Yeah, we've- yeah, we both are. We both <laughs> right. are, and we do. We do have a great lineup. Um, we're we're definitely plugging this because we have been on the uh, the uh, conference planning uh, committee um, and have built a great um, a great schedule. So I would definitely encourage people to go. And Campbell's right. Um, we do lack uh, brewers and distillers at, at those events. So we would love to see both. Awesome. Well, that's great. And and that was the Craft Malting Conference. What was it again, Harmony? And and the dates uh, yeah. and, and location. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. Craft Maltsters Guild Conference in Davis, California at uh, UC Davis. All right. Awesome. February 22nd through 24th. There we go. Yeah. February 22nd through 24th. All right. Well, if you can get out there and check it out, that uh, I highly encourage you to do that. And check out both Campbell and Harmony and all the other great researchers that are giving talks on malt. I'm sure it's going to be a great time. Well, Campbell and Harmony, thank you so much for joining me again in the Brew Lab. Thank you. All right. Next week, Jordan and I will be back applying the science of this episode. See y'all then. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer.